When I first brought this car home, it had a check engine light on on it, and I didn't really care what that was because I knew that I was going to be going through everything on this car anyway, so whatever it is, I'll just find it and fix it. No big deal. I bought a project for a reason. So then I went through and did all the repairs you've seen in the previous installments, just getting it clean, getting it presentable, getting it safe to drive down the road. And so that's all done. And in the meanwhile, the check engine light turned off. Well, they do that from time to time. If, if, a, if a fault has been corrected and the computer identifies, oh, you know, I haven't been noticing this fault for the last two or three drive cycles, we'll just shut off that check engine light. So that might be something that's happened or it may be an intermittent electrical fault. I really have no idea. So today's job is to finally start figuring out what that is. Interestingly, when I took this car out for a little drive this weekend, the check engine light came back on. So I'm just gonna plug in this little OBD2 dongle and we're gonna find out together exactly what this car thinks is wrong with itself. Okay, so we're looking at a screenshot right now of this because I didn't want to have the engine just sitting here running. I, I am in a garage with the door open, but I still am in a garage, so I didn't want like the fumes to just build up from the exhaust. So I've got a P1443 evaporative emission control system purge valve malfunction. I bet the valve is just gummed up. That actually happens on a lot of cars. If you have an older car and it smells like just sour gasoline or kind of smells like diesel or something, like if you kind of have just a wafting smell of like petrochemicals you know that you can smell it's, it's hard to describe if you don't know exactly what it is but if you smell just old stale gasoline from your car it's probably that your purge control valve is is gummed up and stuck uh, or there's something else wrong with your charcoal canister that's not letting it get emptied out uh, that's really common people just simply don't replace the dang thing so it gets stopped up and then it doesn't go uh, so I'll replace that. Uh, they're a pretty cheap part. Um, I can test the one I have, but they're a cheap enough part that I'd rather just simply buy another one anyways and see if it solves the problem. That's not really like throwing the parts cannon at it because I'm not using that as a diagnostic measure. I'm using it as a, hey, that thing's probably junk anyway. So unless it looks brand new, if it looks brand new, yeah, I'll test it. But if it doesn't look brand new, I'm just going to put a different one on there and call it done because they're like $10. It's, it's not even a big deal. The second one is P0136, and I believe that's the secondary oxygen sensor. That's the one after the catalytic converter. Uh, I went into the real-time viewing uh, values, which I'm not going to be able to show you here in this video, but I went into the real-time on that, and I saw that it was getting zero volts from it. And so what that indicates to me is that there's a problem with the secondary oxygen sensor circuit. Like, it's not even actually, you know, it doesn't even have any voltage at all at it. Um, so that's going to potentially be a wiring issue, or it may be the oxygen sensor itself. I'll be able to test for that. I do have a brand new set of oxygen sensors for this car because I consider them a maintenance part. They're something that eventually wears out. They, they become slow because they get kind of pitted or covered with crap, and so they stop being as reliable over time. So I figure any car with 100,000 miles, regardless of its age, uh, if it's 100,000 miles or over and it still has the original ones, they got to get replaced. And if it's 200,000 miles and it still has, you know, ones that have been in there since 100,000, they have to be replaced just as a matter of getting good fuel mileage and, and making maximum power. So those are going to be easy things. Those are actually things I was going to replace anyways. I'll go ahead and, of course, while I'm looking at those, see if I find any, any like wiring faults that are obvious. And of course, I'll measure for circuit continuity with the multimeter. Uh, so that's going to be pretty easy to try and resolve. And those were the only two codes, so that's not terrible. Now, I do know that I have a couple of problems under the hood that are mechanical in nature, so I'm going to go ahead and try to get those taken care of right now. I'm not sure how well this is going to work out for you, you know, watching this on, on your computer or whatever device you have. But one of my favorite things to do when I'm trying to evaluate the condition of parts in a car is I've got a stethoscope here. It's just like the kind that, you know, a doctor would put on your heart, except it's got this probe instead of just a diaphragm. And this probe is connected rigidly to a diaphragm that's inside here. And then, you know, just plugs it into your ear pipes. And you can listen for when it gets quieter or louder as you probe this around. You just have to make contact with various parts. And so if you've got kind of a strange noise, 
Obviously, you don't want to make contact with something that's actually moving, like so these guys here, the outside of this is going to be spinning, this is going to be spinning. You don't want to put this where you're going to hurt yourself or damage your tool or anything. And if you put it on something that's actually spinning, well, you're just going to hear it spinning. You're not going to, you're not going to actually learn anything. But the center of this doesn't turn, or you can also try to get from parts of the bracket that are nearby to things. And it's a really easy way to identify exactly where a, a weird noise is coming from. So while I was running the car to try and figure that stuff out, I found that the bearings that are in this guy here, this is the idler pulley, the bearings on this were failing, they're really loud. Uh, the rear bearing on the alternator sounds like it's on its way out. The front one sounded okay, but, but apparently you can still buy rebuild kits for these alternators. Uh, it's a lot cheaper than buying a whole new alternator. So I've ordered a uh, rebuild kit for this guy and that comes with new bearings as well as new brushes and a couple other little parts. I didn't notice any noise problems down here with the tensioner pulley, but I bought a new tensioner anyways because they're relatively inexpensive. So I'm going to replace the tensioner pulley and the idler pulley now. But first, that airplane over is going to make sure its presence is known. And I'm going to go ahead and start the car and see if uh, somehow I can stick this stethoscope in a way that you can hear what it's doing. Well, upon reviewing the footage, which I will have done later, but I'm recording this in advance in case it doesn't make... Yeah, you get that. Uh, so, upon reviewing the footage, I found that there wasn't enough, like, audio picked up by the stethoscope. Uh, but you'll just have to, I guess, trust that it, it's a loud enough sound that I could hear it with my bare ears. And it was identified as being specifically the bearings in this idler pulley uh, and also the back, the back bearings on the alternator. So we're going to go ahead and remove the belt and remove the tensioner and the idler pulley. And I'm going to replace both of those things and then put the belt back on. The belt itself looks like it's pretty good for now. Okay, we're going to have to do this one thing at a time. That appears to take maybe like a T60, and I don't have a T60. So I'll have to go get a couple of larger Torx bits, but I can replace this guy here. All right, I'm really striking out here. So I've got this pulley, which is the one that came off the car, and it's got a little wear on it, but it's not any smaller diameter. Uh, and it's got a shot bearing, which that I know. Uh, this is the one that Rock Auto said was correct for the 3.8 liter, 3.8 liter, I made sure of that, V6. Uh, notice any difference in size? Now this one may work, it may possibly function on there, but it is a larger diameter which means the belt tensioner is going to be tighter, or it's going to be at least, you know, at the edge of the belt tensioner's limits. Uh, it may still work okay, I guess, but it's not right. So uh, I guess what I'll do is I'll see if this will go on, and then if it'll go on, cool. Uh, but I'm also going to order a new one of these, and I'll have to make sure I measure the diameter of it and get one that's the right diameter. So that's kind of crappy, but uh, I mean, I'm certain I ordered the right thing from Rock Auto, and they probably sent me the right part number. I'm guessing their catalog is just out of out of whack or something. Uh, maybe this was one from a later date. Uh, they're also constructed a little bit differently. This one weighs quite a bit more, although it would spin at a lower RPM being bigger, so I'm not sure if that really matters. Uh, but it's also made of metal, um, so I really, I'm not sure what the difference is. 
Uh, but as long as the belt tracks cleanly in the center of it, uh, and as long as there's enough tension availability or tension adjustability in the belt tensioner, it should be safe to run. Uh, and meanwhile, I'll try to get another one of these. I just don't want to run the one that's falling apart because it'll just fail at any point, and that's not a good thing either. I think I've mentioned in an earlier installment of this that I'm really glad no one's come up with an internet smell printer or a, or a plug-in or whatever that lets you smell what someone is smelling on the other side. Uh, as useful as that would be for something like this where I could go like, hey, you know, waft it towards you and go, hey, you know, that's, that's the smell of a busted purge control valve or of a saturated charcoal canister, uh, which is what I'm smelling right now. I definitely smell it. And I smelled that earlier just hadn't got to where I had actually read the code that formally said, yeah, that's it. But I'm sure we can all imagine some scenarios where you would not want an internet smell plug-in, like prank websites and adult stuff and whatever. It just wouldn't be, I don't think it would work as well, you know, with a, with a smell plug-in. So let's all be glad that no one's invented that yet. And don't get started on it. So the purge control valve, there's a charcoal canister, which is just literally what it sounds like. It's a canister full of an absorbent charcoal material that takes evaporative emissions from the inside of your gas tank and instead of letting those just fly off into the sky and kill birds and stuff like that, it lets you burn it in your engine. So there's this, which I think is probably a sensor. I, I don't actually know yet on this particular vehicle, but I think this might be a sensor for it. And then down here, this is the actual purge control valve down here, and it's just loosely flopping around and may not even be plugged in for all. Oh, it's plugged in. It's just, yeah. Um, so I'll have to dig that out. But those guys get locked up over time. They just They just get locked shut basically by by the fact that they're messing with gross chemicals and the tubing that they're connected to always deteriorates because this is like the volatile the grossest stuff coming off gasoline so it's you know it's ready to react with anything and so it'll react with the rubbers it'll react with whatever the nice thing is that you do you, your engine gets to burn it you know so that's super cool that you get to actually make use of that gasoline since you paid for it and incidentally it's also saving some birds and whatever you know so it's it's a win and a win you whether you care about the environment or not, you, you still get to burn the gas you paid for. So under normal operation, you know, when the, when the car's computer decides the time is right to make use of the purge control valve or open it up, it opens that and your car has a natural vacuum that's drawing that into the intake manifold. And so it'll draw those, those gases out of the canister and burn them. And then, you know, it'll stay clean, basically. It just, it, that's kind of a self-managing system. And I think, I'm not sure, like I said, but I think this might be the tattletale that informs the computer of whether or not that actually has been doing its job. Because otherwise, the computer wouldn't really know. Like, on that car there, it's not smart enough to know whether or not it's failed. It did fail before I bought the car. I replaced it just as a matter of preventative maintenance, because I don't like that smell. And so I'll just do the same thing on this. And, and like I said, I think that's the tattletale. It may also need to be replaced. And if it's cheap, I'll just buy one and call it a day. And I'll replace all the hoses between here and the charcoal canister, which I think is located inside the fender here, if I'm not mistaken. So that'll be an easy fix. The nice thing is that once you get, get the vacuum portion of it working correctly again, the canister tends to clear itself out. Like unless it's been mechanically damaged by collision or some other weird event or circumstance, they tend to just kind of clean themselves out because you've always got the fresh, you know, the fresh gas vapors coming through them and getting them sucked into the engine. So there's always that flow through them. And so they, they tend to clean themselves out naturally or <laughs> mechanically or whatever you want to call it by design. So thankfully that should be an easy fix. The oxygen sensor, um, I'll have to get underneath the vehicle. I'm going to check that code that I got and verify exactly which one it is. And I'll replace all the oxygen sensors because I already have them and that's planned preventative maintenance. And while I'm in there, I'm going to use my multimeter to do continuity testing and just make sure that everything feels like it's connected the way it should be. Uh, that should cause the codes to clear themselves. And when they've cleared themselves, cool, we're in business. It should run better. And we always like it when things run their best. That's 
kind of the name of this game. Uh, meanwhile, I'll order a new one of these guys that's the correct size, now that I know this is the wrong size. Uh, there's still a little bit of slack in this, and the tensioner should be keeping the belt at about the appropriate tension, but I don't like to take chances on that kind of stuff. I'll probably order another belt while I'm at it. Uh, this belt looks good. It doesn't really have any cracks or anything in it, but you know now I'm putting extra load on it. I, I just don't want to deal with it being a question mark. Continuing the game that I've been playing with this car since I bought it, uh, let me know down in the comments below what you think the market value on it is as it sits right now. now. Knowing that I haven't actually done really any of the repairs that we just analyzed today, right? We pulled the codes that were causing the check engine light to come on, and it's two codes, both of which are pretty easy to understand. One of them I was able to get secondary information on using my nose, and so I'm certain that that one's going to be an easy fix, just get it done with. Uh, it's, it's really not a difficult system to analyze and repair. And then the second one is an uh, oxygen sensor that has just flatline zero voltage, which tells me that the sensor itself is probably damaged, or the wiring to it. Uh, if the wiring, for example, came in contact with the exhaust pipe down there, it may have just melted through or shorted out, which would give you a zero voltage. So uh, those are all things that are pretty easy to check once I get underneath the car properly. And so I'll get to work on fixing those. But as of right now, those have not been fixed. I also put a new idler pulley on it, although I don't really think it's the right part. It's a little bit larger diameter than the one that came off of it. There's enough give in the tensioner that it's probably okay forever, but I'm not going to like it, so I'm going to order a new one that's the smaller diameter. I did compare it with my 94 that has the 5 liter V8, and the 94 does have the larger diameter pulley. Uh, and I'm not really sure if that has something to do with RPM, like how fast it's spinning, because a smaller one with the same belt speed is going to spin faster, and I'm not really sure why they made those changes. Geometrically, this one fits in there just fine. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and get the smaller one anyways. So we can consider that like half fixed. Like it put off having a problem, but I'm not happy with it. So it's still going to get fixed better later. So what do you think the market value on this car is as it sits right now? Do you think it's gone up at all just by knowing what the check engine lights codes are for? So it's not a complete mystery. Uh, especially now that we know, you know, my analysis on it, uh, I think it's going to be a pretty easy fix, like legitimately, and, and I don't have any motive to tell you otherwise. A, this is something I know how to do very well, and B, I'm not actually trying to sell the car, so I have no motive to try and say, oh yeah, that, that's an easy fix. I, I know it's an easy fix. I'm the guy who's going to be fixing it, so we'll find out together if I'm wrong about that next time. Additionally, if you're interested in seeing where I go with this, uh, if you think this is an interesting topic, if you want to know more about Mustangs in general, uh, or watch me when I start, you know, actually adventuring now that the, the summer is coming. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button and come along for the ride.